The Freedom Trail is a fantastic urban trail in downtown Boston that's 2.5 miles long. The trail encompasses 16 historical sites ranging from buildings and churches to graveyards. The trail is easy to follow with a brick line that connects the 16 spots and it's a great way to spend a half day in the city. My dad and I set out to do it on a recent trip to the East Coast and here's everything you can see on the Freedom Trail. Let me know what you think in the comments. The best way to start the trail is to take public transportation to Boston Common. We were going directly to the airport after we completed the trail, so we parked at the parking garage next to the USS Constitution. From there, we grabbed an Uber and took it back to the start of the trail at Boston Common. At the start of the trail, you'll find a visitor center with docents that can answer your questions and a store where you can purchase an official map. There's also guided tours that you can take from here at certain times of the day as well. Officially starting the Freedom Trail. Pops is already off the trail. <laughs> hey, there you go. The tour starts at Boston Common, which is America's oldest park. From here you can explore the grounds, which was once a common sheep grazing area, or you can just walk the brick line to the next stop. So this trail is about two and a half miles round trip, and luckily it's really easy to follow, as you just follow these red bricks the entire time. So pick up a map for three bucks so you can see more information about all the sites. During the summer, the Common is a fantastic place to hang out in Boston with Shakespeare in the park, concerts, and all sorts of other things. There's a ton of history here with everything from hangings and duels to speeches by Martin Luther King Jr. happening on the grounds. After about a five minute walk, you'll make it to the second stop, which is the Massachusetts State House. The State House here was built in 1798 and the land that it sits on was originally owned by John Hancock. Unfortunately, the State House is closed today, but sometimes you can go inside of it. The first mile of this walk is where most of the things are at, so if you are short on time, you can always just do the first half and then come back. From the State House, it's another five minute walk, basically back to where you started the Freedom Trail to get to the Park Street Church. I was told that most everything would be open on a Monday, but unfortunately that wasn't the case for a few of the churches along the walk. We only got to see this one and another one from the outside. Hopefully it's open for you to go in if you go though. The church here was built in 1809 and its memorable steeple is supposedly one of the first things that travelers saw when they arrived in Boston. Right next to the church is our third stop on the Freedom Trail, the Granary Burying Grounds. There are many different cemeteries along this trail, but this is the one with the most well-known people in it. Because of that, it's also the most visited in Boston. It became a cemetery in 1660, and here you'll find everyone from Paul Revere and James Otis to Benjamin Franklin's parents and all of the people who were killed in the Boston Massacre. Pop said he loves John Hancock. Why do you love John Hancock, Pops? He's the one who wrote his name big so that the king would be sure to see it. <laughs> It's pretty easy to find the main graves like John Hancock and Paul Revere as there's often tour groups gathered around them. People often think that the large obelisk in the middle of the cemetery is for Ben Franklin, but it's actually for his parents. Also, on the outer edge is the gravestone for Samuel Adams. This is an incredibly popular one for visitors because of his historical significance and because of the brewery in Boston of the same name. Right across the street from the Bean Town pub is the cemetery. Pops found an old friend to hang out with. I know you're in your golden years, but uh, you're probably sure that you know that St. Adam's is right across the street. Continuing on from the cemetery, the next stop was another five minute walk. Here you'll find the King's Chapel and the King's Chapel burying grounds. Like the Park Street Church, the King's Chapel was also closed on the day that we were there. But we were able to walk the King's Chapel burying grounds. This cemetery was actually the first burying grounds in Boston. It doesn't have a lot of the notable political figures, but it does supposedly have the grave of the first woman who stepped off the Mayflower. The Freedom Trail just takes a short detour to go to that cemetery and then it continues around the front of the church. One of the things I love about the Freedom Trail is how many people you'll find out enjoying it on any given day. It's awesome the history has been preserved so well and is so easy to interact with here. The next spot you'll reach is the site of the first public school which was built here in 1635. The school is still run today, but not in this location. 
Here you'll also find a statue of Benjamin Franklin. It was put here in front of the old city hall in 1865. If you don't want to do a self-guided version like we're doing, you can take tours. They've been like six or seven tours already that we've seen that will walk you around and tell you the history of the places. Our next stop is the Old Corner Bookstore, which is now uh, Chipotle. I mean, I love Chipotle. It's one of my favorite places, but it's kind of a bummer that it's no longer the Old Corner Bookstore. In the mid-1800s, this building was home to the publishers Ticknor and Fields. They published many famous books like The Scarlet Letter and Uncle Tom's Cabin. Across the street from the Chipotle, you can see the Irish Famine Memorial, which is not part of the Freedom Trail, but is still worth visiting. Directly across the street from the memorial is our next stop, the Old South Meeting House. This one requires you to purchase a ticket in order to enter, which was $15 when we went, but also includes the Old State House, which is a few stops away. This site was built as a church in 1729 and was supposedly the largest building in Boston at its time. Over the years, it was used as a church that many leaders like Samuel Adams attended. And it was also used as a meeting ground for many of the different conversations that were had on the American Revolution. All of this is spotlighted in the exhibits that you can see as you walk around the museum. Leaving the Old South Meeting House, the road continues through a more modern part of downtown Boston on its way to the Old State House. The ticket we bought earlier works for the Old State House Museum too. The Old State House was built in 1713 and it's another museum you can visit on the Freedom Trail. So here is the Freedom Trail that we are walking through the city on the old map. It was a really great museum as it follows many of the different events that led to the American Revolution. Upstairs you can also walk through some of the government offices and the council chamber as it would have been in 1764. Right outside is the site of the Boston Massacre. This is the next stop on the Freedom Trail and was the site where five people were killed by the British Redcoats on March 5th, 1770. Can't get over seeing this building next to all these skyscrapers. Less than a five minute walk brings you to the historic Faneuil Hall. We made it to the marketplace, so we're gonna take a break and have some lunch. This building was used as an open air market and a meeting place, and now it has a store for the National Park Service. Here you can learn more about the trail, see a map of it, and even buy souvenirs. There's also a few other shops that are located in here as well. The hall only has some shops for the National Park Service basically, but you can get lunch here. There's lots of restaurants. Right on the other side is the Quincy Marketplace, which is a great stop to get lunch if you're walking the trail and it's around that time. My dad and I stopped at the Boston Chowder Company, which had a deal that gave you a lobster roll, a clam chowder, and a drink. Pop's got the famous award-winning clam chowder in a bread bowl. And if you remember on the PCH video, we were tasting chowder everywhere. So here I'm in the real spot. New England clam chowder. It's very really good. Some of the places in California are better. <laughs> Win in Boston. It's good. It's not as good as the one we had yesterday, but it's good. Not a bad place for lunch, lots of options there. In terms of the lobster roll, if you're staying in Boston, you can definitely find a better lobster roll than that. But not bad for a Freedom Trail walk heading on. If you have more time and you're looking for a sit-down lunch place, you could also consider the Union Oyster House. This is supposedly the oldest restaurant in the United States, and so it's a fun place to get lunch on the Freedom Trail. If this is something you really wanna do, then I definitely recommend getting a reservation as it's often busy. Even if you aren't going to eat here, be sure to stick your head in as it has a lot of unique decor on the history of Boston. The Union Oyster House is supposed to be one of the oldest restaurants in America. I haven't ate there, but it's cool to go in and see the history. Do let me know if it's worth it if you eat there in the comments. As we continued the trail towards Paul Revere's house, we decided to make a short stop to have some of Boston's famous cannolis. 
In Boston, there are two famous shops to get them at about five minutes walk from each other, Mike's Pastries and Modern Pastries. In case you've never had a cannoli before, they're an Italian delicacy. Basically, it's some fried pastry dough which is wrapped in a tube and then it's filled with a sweet ricotta cheese. Most of the places also fill it with lots of other things and have lots of different toppings to put on it. All right, here's our extremely scientific test. We got modern right here and we got Mike's right here and we just did traditional ricotta with chocolate chips and a plain wrap. So, Pops, let's do it. We'll start with modern. Modern. A little thinner, if you notice. Boy, that's yummy. That's a good one? Wow, that's delicious. What's the rating for that one? Out of 10. I, I ten? don't know. I've never had one before. I'll call it a nine or a ten. I don't know. All right. Well, let's here we go. Round two. Extremely scientific test. Mike's. This one's not quite as sweet, I don't think. Okay. I, I probably would. If this was a nine, this is like a nine point five. Oh, you like Mike's better? It's a little better. Not hugely better, but a little better. All right. Pops is going with Mike's. All right. My turn. Going with modern first. Very good. Mike's? Man, they're both so good. I think I gotta do Mike's too, but just by like the tiniest edge. Let me know which one your favorite is in the comments if you have both. After our cannoli detour, we only have a few more stops on the Freedom Trail. After reading about it, I heard that most tourists prefer Mike's and most locals prefer modern, so I guess it followed our review as well. Our next stop was a visit to Paul Revere's house which was built in 1680 and is the oldest remaining structure in downtown Boston. You can take a tour of the house but we didn't have time on this trip so we just saw it from the outside and then continued on. From here the trail continues through downtown Boston towards Paul Revere Mall. This is where the famous statue of Paul Revere is that you've probably seen before and that's popular for tourist pictures. While this area is relatively small, there's a nice fountain in the middle and then there's lots of information plaques and memorials on the left-hand side honoring famous people from Boston. At the end of the mall is the Old North Church, which is where the two lanterns were hung that started Paul Revere's famous ride. It's a Monday, so unfortunately the Old North Church is not open. I have to keep going. There's a sign on the church talking about how it was used to warn people of the British marching to Lexington and Concord. After visiting the Old North Church, the trail heads up the hill to the last burying grounds on the Freedom Trail. Copps Hill dates back to 1659 and was the largest burying ground on the city's north end. One of the famous revolutionaries that was buried here was Robert Newman who hung the lanterns for Paul Revere. When you leave the burying ground, it's about a 15 minute walk over the Charlestown sites. A lot of people turn around here because this is the end of the downtown Boston area, but I suggest continuing on if you have the opportunity. Freedom Trail is broken over here, so uh, we have to go back across the street. This is the temporary Freedom Trail until they fix the bridge. This is definitely not as exciting as the Freedom Trail has been with our uh, painted line on the ground. But we're getting to where we need to go. If you have the opportunity, late October is a great time to visit the city as you'll see some fall colors like we did. As the trail continues, you'll cross the bridge and go through a few different crosswalks. It's always easy to follow the brick path and there's even signs noting the Freedom Trail as you're walking through. Once you make it over to the Charlestown area, there's only two things really to see. There's Bunker Hill Memorial and the USS Constitution, and then that finishes your time on the Freedom Trail. As you're walking, you'll see a park called Training Hill. Here you can see a memorial to the Americans that lost their lives at the Battle of Bunker Hill. As you continue forward, you'll see one of the last stops on the Freedom Trail, which is the Bunker Hill Monument. This monument sits at 221 feet tall and was dedicated to the battle which was important in the early part of the American Revolution. We've made it to the Bunker Hill Monument. You used to be able to go up inside of it, but since COVID, they said they don't let people back in there. If you haven't heard about this battle, I definitely recommend reading about it. It's where the famous don't shoot until you see the whites of their eyes quote came from. 
It was a bloody battle and it's interesting to learn about how the colonists were able to hold the hill for a few waves of the British soldiers attacking. So the Freedom Trail actually ends right there. And you can either stop or you can go down and see the USS Constitution, which is another little offshoot of the Freedom Trail over here. We're back at the park and this is where the split is, where we went up to Bunker Hill and now we're continuing on to the Navy Yard. From Bunker Hill, it's about a 10 minute walk to the USS Constitution and the Boston Naval Shipyard. It's pretty cool to see the historic boat with the Boston skyline behind it. The boat's closed today for cleaning, but let me know how it is if you get a visit in the comments. The boat is closed every Monday and Tuesday, so that's why we couldn't visit it when we were there. There is the USS Constitution Museum right at the end of the Freedom Trail, which you can go in. This museum has great interactive exhibits that talk about the boat and its history, including how it got the name Old Ironsides. I really enjoyed it and it's great for a whole family as it tells you a lot about how the sailors lived on the boat and many more stories and history from the time period. And just like that, we have made it to the end of the Freedom Trail. End of the Freedom Trail, Pops. End of Freedom Trail. Hopefully you enjoyed exploring the Freedom Trail with us in Boston. This is an awesome urban trail. Get out here and check it out for yourself and we will see you on the next video.